There we go. Because, see, we are in a series where we are looking at some of the uh, stories and the theology behind our favorite hymns. And so today, we're going to be looking at the song, Joy to the World. So if you've got your Bibles open, open them up to Psalm 98. Or if you're following along online, uh, you can go to columbiagrove.org forward slash, um, thank you, message notes, because I got to tell you a story about this guy right here. Mr. Isaac Watts. You like, you like his haircut? It's real nice. Well, so he lived from 1674 to 1748, and he, he, was, a, he was a brilliant young man. Um, so by the time he was like elementary school, he spoke like four languages, super, super smart. But like a lot of really smart young people, he had a bit of a tendency to be critical. And so in the church that he was going to and his family was a part of, um, you know, they would do a lot of uh, singing of the Psalms. And, uh, well, Isaac, wait, wait a second, what's going on here? What just happened here? Oh, oh, we're already, okay, here we go. That's, oh, that's nice, thank you. Okay, so in the Isaac, um, he was just complaining that the, that the music was boring. You ever heard a young person say that? Yeah. Music, music is boring, music is dull, man, everybody in church is dead, it's horrible. Well, see, Isaac had a dad, and his dad, in that moment, gave him some advice. All right here, he said, well then, young man, this is where I want the Facebook feed to just like focus on, I just love this, okay. Well then, young man, why don't you give us something better to sing? So his daddy he challenged him, or if you put it in the in way I put it, all right, Isaac, stop complaining and start contributing. Yeah. I just love to park on that for a little while. Just uh, hide there up at Facebook land. Yeah, you're in, uh, you're, you're in your pajamas right now. You're not really in church. You're just in your pajamas. But anyways, for all of us, you know, stop complaining and start contributing. You know, there's lots of things in the world that are wrong, but why don't we go out there and make a difference? Great advice, right? Now, as, as truly remarkable it is that Isaac heard this advice from his dad, even more remarkable is he followed it. And so from I, in Isaac Watts' life, he ended up writing more than 600 hymns, um, including some hymns that you've probably heard before, like um, um, the, the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Remember that one? on which the Prince of Glory died, or things like Jesus shall reign, or I sing the mighty power of God, or oh God our help in ages past. Some of you know those songs, right? That's Isaac Watts. And here we are centuries later, we still know these songs, and they've still made a difference and an impact in our lives. So Isaac followed his daddy's advice. He stopped complaining. He started contributing, and I'm so glad that he did. And then his song, Joy to the World, which is just one of the, our favorite kind of Christmas songs out there, um, he, you know, he, he ended up writing that. And that song is written, uh, is based on Psalm 98. And so that's what I wanted to take a look at today. Uh, thanks to Isaac. Thanks, Isaac, for listening to your dad. Thanks, Isaac, for, uh, for trying to make uh, the music of the church better. Let's take a look at this song and the psalm that it's based on. So, if you got your Bibles, and I hope you do, we're going to read together Psalm 98. It's a psalm of joy. Okay. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So it's imagining this time in the future, perhaps even in the distant future, where every tribe, every nation, every race, every tongue, everybody knows about the goodness of God. Yes. Sing for joy, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. That's pretty good. With the trumpets and the blast of a ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord the King. So it's like, employ all these musicians, make a lot of noise, get really excited. Here's all these people, people engaged in worship. And then it's not just 
the human race that engages in worship. Check this out. Here's sounds, I, I, I've never heard them, but I can't wait to. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, let the rivers clap their hands. What do you think that would sound like? I don't know, but I can't wait to hear it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to what? Judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let them sing before the Lord because he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples. Let's just keep that up on the screen. All the peoples with equity. So that's the reason why there's all this worship. That's the reason why all the people are worshiping. That's the reason why all creation is worshiping, why the oceans are resounding, why the, why the rivers are clapping their hands, why the, even the mountains are singing. It's because the Lord will come to judge the earth. He will judge the earth in righteousness and its peoples with equity. The whole world is filled with joy at the very thought of, of the King of kings and the Lord of lords finally arriving on the scene. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's, there's a choir rehearsal happening in creation right now, like just ready to, just ready to explode in praise erupt in worship. The whole world is longing for that moment. The whole world. And yet right now, there's a reason why the world is waiting for the judge to come, to judge the world in righteousness. And it's peoples with equity. There's a reason, isn't there, why the world is longing for that. Because right now, the world has a bad boss. You know, Genesis 1, right as the world is being created and Adam and Eve and all that cool stuff happening, the very first instructions that God gives Adam and Eve is first is to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, Adam and Eve, you're in charge. Then in Genesis 2, is to tend the garden and take care of it. You're in charge. Take care of it, Adam and Eve. You're in charge. Humanity, take care of it. How are we doing? I, I, was, I was reading this week. Um, so we've got about seven and a half billion people on the planet. This incredible, beautiful, prosperous, res resource rich gift. Seven and a half billion people on the planet. And about, and we, this earth produces so much food, we actually throw away a third of all it, all it creates. Do you know that? In the United States, it's, it's even more than that. More than a third of what gets produced by our farmers and orchardists and all, just, whoop, just throw it away. We have the technology to, to keep food um, well preserved for. Weeks, months, years, centuries, if you're talking about Twinkies and, you know, things like that. Like, wish you, I don't know if you want to eat that stuff. But, but we can get food, high-quality food, to anywhere in the world and have it preserved for about as, as long as we could ever imagine. And still one in seven people on this incredible planet is hungry. Nine million people will die this year according to the World Health Organization, from either starvation or starvation-related illnesses. When there's more than enough food to go around to everyone. And that's just one example. You know, we, 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 we read of all these things. Now, some things are getting better, and thankfully, you know, the percentage of the Earth's population that is in dire hunger is, thankfully, it has been lessening, but you think of all the things that keep people from getting the access to even the basics of, of food, and it has nothing to do with this, and it has everything to do with this. 
power mongering and the, when politics gets corrupted, when we care about the, more about the lines that we've drawn on this than the people who live on this. That's why creation is groaning, like we read in Romans chapter 8, it's groaning in eager anticipation for the children of God to be revealed. It's waiting on tiptoe. It's, it is rehearsing for the grandest worship service ever because one day, one day soon, this planet is going to be under new management. It's going to be a corporate takeover, and it's going to be awesome. And when that happens, the oceans will resound with joy, the rivers will clap their hands, the, the, the mountains themselves will sing. It will be truly a day of joy to the world. Now, when the earth thinks about the coming of, of, of the king, the coming of the king of kings, the, one, the, he, the earth is thinking about the end of human history. The earth is, is eagerly anticipating that day, a day of joy. Now, you feeling the joy? You excited about that? You excited about Jesus' return? Yeah, I, I know. It's, it's, yeah, mm. <laughs> See, the, the truth is, for a lot of us, myself included, as I think about Jesus' return, it actually evokes some fear. So what's it going to be like? I think that's one of the reasons why, and I'm, I'm glad we've got lots of groups that like to study the book of Revelation, but you get a group of teenagers together, you're like, what part of the Bible do you want to study? They're like, Revelation. Why? Because I want to know when it's going to happen. Right? I remember as a, as a teenager, <clears throat> I was just so nervous about the return of Christ. I mean, I was excited about it and starting to learn about it, and I'm thinking, you know, if Jesus comes back too soon, what am I going to miss out on? You know, I, I was thinking about marriage. I was thinking about things that come along with marriage. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about, oh, like, what, what if Jesus comes back and I miss out? Like, so let's just do a little, a little, um, little um, imagination exercise. So imagine that this afternoon you opened up your Bible. And on the very first page of your Bible, and as it turns out, every single Bible Everywhere, wow, all across the world, in every language, on the very first page of every Bible, on the screen of every Bible app, on the home page of every computer that has Bible software on it, simultaneously comes the same message, all in red letters, because Jesus always speaks in red letters. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm coming tomorrow, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Get ready. Can you, you imagine that? Every Bible, every, God, Jesus speaks through the Word of God, man. <laughs> Woo! What would you be thinking about? And here's why I want to poke at this. is because, see, our fears, our fears reveal our idols. So whether that's, you know, in me, if, if, if I were to see that right now, as much as I'd like to be like, yes, I've been waiting for this day, that's awesome, woo, let me just get ready to sing with the oceans and stuff, I mean, that sounds great, um, I'd be thinking about things like, well, 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 wait a second, Lauren's getting married next summer, and I want to be there, or, you know, in the next 10 years, I, maybe I'll be a grandpa, and I don't want to miss out on that. I, I would be thinking about, being honest, and maybe we, I hope we can be honest here, I'd be, I'd be thinking about, if, if Jesus is coming back real soon, what, what will I miss? Or, or maybe you think about, well, then I, I better go and do, and you fill in the blank, because it's the last time I'm going to have a chance to do that. So maybe you think about a substance you really enjoy. Or a habit that you are pretty certain is not going to continue in heaven. <laughs> Those are our sins. Those are our secret sins. 
those are the things that we end up making our idols, making the things that we turn to for comfort instead of God. And, and even though I bring up things like family, and they, I mean, come on, family is one of the best things in the world. What is it in me that believes that I can actually take better care of my family than Jesus can? What is it in me that believes that when the veil of sin is lifted from the world, finally lifted from the world, that there are things that I enjoy that will honestly get worse rather than better? That's crazy, isn't it? You realize that every good gift, every good pleasure in life, whether that's family or food or drink or rest or vacation or exercise or, any, or travel or any of the things, any of the good things in life that you enjoy, it, do, you, do you not know that all of those things will be better when Jesus returns? That the author of every good gift will let every good thing be not just a little bit better, but exponentially better? When the veil of sin is lifted, can you imagine what your first taste of food in heaven will be like? I think we should. Because far too often, when we think of Christ's return, rather than being filled with joy like the, world, like the created world around us, like the scriptures tell us, that, you know, as, they, as, as the, the mountains and the, and the rivers and the oceans, they are longing, they are longing for the king to return. We don't long, we don't long it for it so much. Because our fears, our fears, they reveal our, our idols. They reveal the things that we have placed before God. Things that we turn to for comfort and a sense of significance. And that's why the Psalms and the songs of worship that we sing based on the Psalms, can be so very, very important. Because, you see, worship does something for us. It, worship helps us to delight in the right things. Helps us to focus our hearts on the things that truly last and matter. It's When we worship, we are training. We're training our hearts. We're training our hearts To, to delight in the things of God. Because we don't naturally do that, do we? we? We often think, you know, God can often be sort of on the sidelines of life. Well, it's really, the, it's really my hobbies. It's really my family. It's really my, my vices. It's really my sins. It's really me getting what I want. That's what's going to make me happy. That's what's going to give my life true joy. But worship helps us to delight in the right things. So when we worship, we, we're, we're training our hearts. We're teaching ourselves. This matters. Care about this. Delight in this. Find joy in this. Find fun in this. Find pleasure in this. Because God is so, so, so good. Do, do you hear me, church? Because you know, when we fix our eyes on Jesus... And he'll start fixing you. Not so much that you that we're called to be focusing on those, on, oh God, I'm so sorry for that. Oh God, I'm so sorry for that. Oh God, I'm so sorry for that. I mean, it, it, there can be, it, repentance is good. But see, transformation through grace isn't about necessarily focusing on all the areas in your life that are wrong. It's about focusing on the one, the one. And what's his name? Jesus, the one, the one, the one who can make things right. As you fix your eyes on Jesus, he will begin that process of fixing you. As your heart is trained to delight in the right things, we find pleasure in the things that we should be finding pleasure in. We find joy in the one we should be finding joy in. And all of the other things, all of the, all of the lesser pleasures, all of the secondary good things that God puts in our life, 
they find their place. They find their perspective. So I want to challenge you to do something. Okay. So we're going to sing that song. We're going to sing the song, Joy to the World. And um, I want to challenge you. Oh, sorry about that. I want to challenge you to push yourself just a little bit. Now, um, as, just a, as we sing that song, as a, as a way of just training our hearts. God, I want to delight in you. God, I want to find joy in your return. God, I, I, want, to, I, I want to fix my eyes on Jesus. I want to take pleasure in his plans for my life. So, you know, if, if you're the kind who, who never claps, I'd like you to try clapping. Okay? You know, or like, you know, clap to the beat or something like that. Just, just, just push yourself just a little bit. Just a little bit. If, if, if you're not the kind who ever raises their hand in worship because it's only the, like the really out there weird people who do that, you know who you are. I love you, okay? You know, to consider doing that. If, if you're normally the kind of person who sings really quiet, try singing just a little bit louder. Just to push yourself just a little bit. Sing loud enough that your heart can begin to hear it. All creation is longing for the return of Christ. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples with equity. That our hearts would be trained to put delight, to place joy, to, to find pleasure in the things that are truly good. In the one who is truly good. In the one who will one day return to set this world right. Is there any better thing than that? Let's train our hearts. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing the song. I'm going to, can I, Chris, can I borrow your, your super cool guitar? Okay, I'm going to borrow Chris's super cool guitar. I'm going to find the super cool pick. It's up here somewhere. Okay, all right. Okay, here we go. Going to, something with this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and let's see if this is good. This is good here. All right. Is it working? That'll work. Okay, let's do something with that. You can stand or you can sit, whatever, whatever you're going to do, but I'd like you to push yourself just a little bit. Push yourself. Sing loud enough. Push yourself in worship enough that your heart starts to feel it. Let's place our joy. Let's find delight in, in the one who is truly, truly Delightful. And then when we get to the end of the song, we're just going to sing through it once, and we're going to sing the line, joy, or joy to the world. Joy, joy to the world, the Lord is come. And then I want you to just make as much noise as you possibly can. Now, some of you, you're not going to like, like just a, a little bit more than you would normally make. So my dear, dear introvert friends, you can go from this to this. Yay. Like, whatever you're going to do. But just to push yourself just a little tiny bit, a little tiny bit, just enough that your heart can hear it, that your heart can hear it. Because when we fix our eyes on Jesus, he'll start fixing you. He is the one who is truly delightful. He is the one who can truly bring joy in your life. He is the one that the whole world, the whole stinking beautiful world is longing for. Let's long along with it. Letter. 